myself alone, so I'll seek the help of uh, some of my friends who are here. Um, we missed uh, Karen in the morning, so she'll make up for it, Karen. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, our good friend, and uh, Tiffany. So we will kind of bounce the question if we can answer. If not, then we'll go back. Um, but on the note that that uh, I think Mihala ended, um, I, I would really uh, urge you to go back and look at the, this year's Cyber Future Foundation's mission statement. It is, we, we want to raise the hope and serve with humility for a greater good and humanity. I mean, hope, humility, and humanity are the three key pillars that CFF is based on. And that is what we are embracing and making forward. This We have always been there. Um, and then if you think about the work we are doing, we are protecting and you know, kind of securing other. This is this year, CISA took our, took our uh, and so the, um, I would say Chris Krebs, all credit to him, and securing today and uh, you know, defending the future. Defending today and securing the future, right? <laughs> well, very interesting. Um, so yeah, just gather together, please, uh, now. Uh, let let, uh, let uh, each one of you introduce yourself, and then, uh, then we'll open the floor up. Yeah. Certainly, thank you all. I'm Karen Baker. I head up uh, security for uh, technology risk and governance for Thomson Reuters. Hey, I'm Mustafa Trevay, I'm CTO of the Recorded Future. We do threat intelligence and third party risk assessments. Tiffany? Uh, hi, I'm Tiffany. I'm a Chief Strategy Officer for a company based in San Francisco called Spectrum Lab. What we do is we use AI to detect everything which is toxic content. So our platforms as customers uh, vary from dating platforms, gaming platforms, all the way to government. So if you have any question about uh, data privacy um, and all the way to quantum computing, it's a uh, personal a space I do personal investment in and welcome your questions. All right. Great, thank you, and uh, I'm hopefully now by now familiar with uh, Fuji with uh, whatever hat you want me to. I'll, I'll go to this ask me anything uh, sessions, and you know when we go to venture startup uh, advisory forums or within EY, we we'll go to our leadership uh, you know sessions. So we have ask me anything. It's not that I can ask answer everything, but I can say no. Um, so anyway, we'll we'll try. Okay. So who has the first question? All right, Mihaila, let's yes. get started. Yes, so, so you know, about toxic content, right? So how do we define that? And maybe what's context toxic for you is not for me. And so where is the bound? Where is the boundary? Toxic I know it's content. fuzzy. But so what is, I mean, who are you to tell me what is toxic content? So that's, that's my question. Perfect. Well, we identify you are definitely a challenging uh, question asker. Um, uh, so, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful question, right? So um, to actually probably even decompose your question, you know, how it defines toxic, um, it's by category, right? So we look at from sexual harassment, uh, underage child abuse, uh, uh, child usage, child abuse, uh, insult, self-harm, all the way to uh, small weapons uh, trading and terrorism, right? So you, first of all, by categories, uh, uh, tox toxicity. Now it is a level of to being toxic. For example, a gaming company that we work with uh, will have a very different level of tolerance versus a dating company. Because most of the most famous games, it is filled with violence and sex, right? And versus if you say anything like that in a dating uh, platform for once, you're banned, right? So you have different level of um, uh, toxicity. Now it comes to the solution part. I think today there are a lot of conversations about AI. Now, if I say the word F-U-C-K-Y-O-U, Right? Um, itself, then the next ring mean anything toxic. Because if we are great friends, you say that to me, it's absolutely fine. But the, 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 the idea is how you put that text or content in the context. How you actually not text-based to define toxic versus give the context. That constant context will tell you if it's toxic or not. If the two gamers say that, it's maybe a red flag. If you say that a thousand times, it is a bad, it's a bigger red flag. Yeah, you have to follow on. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm all, I'm all for you, but you know, so where is the boundary? Because freedom of speech versus who are you to constrain what so, you have to say. So that's yeah, where I was yeah. going. Yeah. As, all right, let, let's stop on. Yeah, let me comment. So since we're actually doing quite a bit of classifications like that, I think there are cases where there is actually objective data. So we've spent a lot of time classifying discussions on 
things like 4chan and 8chan, trying to sort of do early detection of potential school shooters, things like that. There you actually have an objective judgment, you know, someone actually did up, went out and did something bad. So in those cases you can do it, but otherwise, you know, we're always saying that in the end, algorithms can help highlight what some human review should be looking at. So I think in the end, we're at the stage where we can have the AI methods useful for doing the sort of big filtering, highlighting potential, for example, toxic speech. But you really want a human judgment in the end to decide, you know, if this is actually something you should ban, for example. There's still some big brother kind of. The, you know, in many of your cases, I guess, it's the owner of the platform who sets the rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and, and it's interesting, the platform set the rules, we help human beings to make decisions. But look, there are 50,000 people somewhere in emerging markets look at toxic content every day. Do you really want human beings to look at those content, uh, toxic content? You might not. If, if the machines learn one day, as human beings can do, that might be a task you want to give to machines rather than humans. Maybe more normal and neutral, but again, we, have, we had the same topic up earlier on, like, you know, who's coding and how much, so NG asked the same question, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, this comes back to the question of bias. You know, we're all good people in this room, so so we all want to avoid bias. But I mean, in, in, in other contexts, you would say that that's statistically significant. I mean, if you're if you're a bank, you know you want to know who's going to default on their loans. So in one way, that's a biased judgment. On, on, you know, you don't care. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so in one way it's a biased judgment, but on the other hand it's statistically significant, you know, so you still need to take it into account, otherwise you, you lose money. Yeah, all right, another question. Let's change the topic. Richard. So, uh, in the world of cybersecurity, we've been doing it for so long, we really haven't made much progress in what we're trying to do. We still use passwords, we still have problems with criminality, things are potentially getting worse, not better. Um, what do you see as potential solutions for uh, that, that solution? Is it technology? Is it people? Is it that we're really, as earlier, this is a reflection of humanity, so therefore it's not going to get necessarily better, or maybe it will? Yeah. Oh, very loaded question. All right, I have my thing on it. Let's take it as a practitioner view, right? You know, and, and then maybe you know. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Craig. Oh, you're you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, it was a setup, was it? Was it? I didn't Absolutely. know that. <laughs> and it's one I have responsibility for, so I should be able to answer this one. Um, it's multi-threaded, obviously, in terms of the solution. As we think about the challenges in this space, I focus very much on governance framework. So looking, what, what does that cover? Everything from how we um, build frameworks, evaluate risks, and the evaluation of risks and management thereof of those, whether it's um, internal or whether it's of our supply chain, have many critical elements around the identification of security risks. Um, I mean, training and awareness is only one small part of it, but it has to be taken on the global sphere, I think from large organizations, it has to be multi-threaded and, and complex in answer, but with the rigor and discipline to actually be able to be deployed across an entire organization. I will, I will also add to it to, um, I was talking uh, with the gentleman from UNTP, but there was a panel about the leadership. So, most of the customers, the, the people I talk with, they're CISOs, right? So in those dating platforms, social network platforms. The challenge, personal I've encountered, is people who try to buy trust and safety AI from myself, it's not like I sell CRM. Who is my buyer? Is that legal counsel? Is that CISO, right? And that challenge that I've encountered to identify who the buyer for the company basically means that organization hasn't actually defined or implemented a people organization for us to really implement trust and safety for AI. So people is one thing. Another thing is how we create a solution when we're looking into the issue is we are entering into a time where it's just the way too much data, right? That's one of the reasons we're talking even about quantum computing. The computation is no longer enough for us to process the data. Now there are two issues we try to address is how you can have structured, I mean, uh, organized and structured metadata, label the data, 
if the data is not clean, how are you going to use AI? AI is as good as the data gets. Yeah. So that's a big problem to solve. I think the data and the people um, are the two issues that we have seen in the space, why it's not any, getting any better, because we didn't take the right approach to really look at the problem. I yeah. completely agree there. I was just going to add to the point that when we think about the people aspect of that, generally, um, and I see this in, in I have seen it in each of the organizations that I've worked for, is that the larger the organization, the more a tendency to have collective accountability. So to your point, it's who is actually responsible. Right. And we How get those questions. Accountability is very important because typically in risk committees that I've chaired, we have, and it is part of the, the terms of reference to the committee actually, that there will be collective accountability. There will be you know, multiple sign-off for acceptance of risks as well, and great benefits to actually doing that. But when it comes down to securing the decisions that need to be made for the future, that also brings complexities, I think, as well. Yeah, so, and I think organizationally that absolutely makes sense. I have a different frame of reference now, I'll tell you honestly, this is why this keeps us taking together, and I, I always try to pull you into this diverse conversation, is because I think, you know, when you are the, uh, you are the competitor as well as you are the judge, it's very difficult to judge this community. We are all in the same profession and we could say we work so hard, why are we not changing, right? So I try to step outside the bounds and see, you know, who are we building this for, right? We are professionals, we are building it, uh, you know, we are securing our organizations, we are also uh, citizens of the country, so we want to uphold the laws. We are also uh, consumers, so we, we need to have uh, our own self-responsibility to make sure that we, you know, we have good practices, overall cyber hygiene. But think about it, I, I always, I, or at least I try to see this through the lens of my, my son, right? I mean, he's always hooked up to this, you know, the iPads and iPhones, Minecraft, and it just goes on and on. I, I think we probably need a Greta Thunberg for privacy or, or security, honestly. Who cannot, I mean, who would not stop until they figure it and say, okay, you know what? You are actually leaving a good uh, world behind us. Or, or that what you're building is actually being, uh, we can take it, right? Now I think we are in this huge flux where I think climate change has got a voice. Uh, we really don't have that kind of a voice. There is a privacy voice, but it is very scattered. Um, that's one aspect. The second aspect is within organizations. I, I, I think we have a personal responsibility that we execute as leaders uh, and day in and day out, uh, but the collective responsibility has not gone to the level that it's been. And I completely agree with you, Karen, in terms of that accountability, right? So, I mean, uh, what happens when you have big data breach? The, that CISO gets fired and the whole board gets wiped off. They start new, but you know, there's a whole systemic legacy that we are inherited that not one CISO or one board can really uh, address, right? And the, and the whole, you know, Equifax is our public uh, knowledge now, so we can uh, attest to that. That there has been so many changes, but will it change anything immediately? It will not. There's a, there's a imminent change, an imminent collective change required, which, I mean, as, as the vice chair of one of the bigger arms of, you know, where you do it, and, and Richard from, you know, you have a global presence for technology, and I'm so on and so forth, I can go into this room, but I think there's a collective responsibility and, and statement. That's why I think when Laura brought up the Paris Tech Accord, that was an important statement, and I don't know how many of us actually are following this and, and getting traction on making sure, uh, is that the right thing to do? Because when, um, when Tom, I think, mentioned that uh, yesterday or last night, that is, they announced that it has gone fourfold, but is that the right thing to do, right? So it's a collective responsibility that I think would change the way we, we perceive this. All right, great, next question. We should get those bouncy balls next time, yeah. right? Yeah. But I have to sign a liability insurance of a million dollars. Well, I'm from Doha, Qatar. We're a small country. The total number of countries in this world is 300,000. And, you know, 70% of them are under 21. But um, we built media. We've got a lot of technology. And we have 5G in our country. We have, you know, everything in place, you know, when it looks at, we're looking at AI, we've got an ICT system which uh, looks at every aspect of smart cities, we build smart cities, we've got everything in place, we're like a living lab in a small scale. But um, from our experience, what we're saying is, 
We've been hacked many times. We've had more than 1,200 um, 1200 attempts only last year to break into our system. We've got our neighbours who, you know, broke into our uh, got the news agency. We've got a you know a court case within the International Court of Justice. So we're just looking at you know as a small country. The main thing I wanted to point out is that um, you know when it comes to cyberspace, if you look at it as that as a space, like when we look at the sea. There was a United Nations law for the seas, which became IMO eventually, International Mar Maritime Organization. It's very well regulated, and we share the sea, the shipping routes. It's a common ground. Um, can we look at the cyberspace in the same way? Because it becomes a collective responsibility, and how can leadership, I mean, you're a foundation which is trying to push a consolidated approach so that there is a systematic way of handling security in this space. You know, if you look at the space outside, when we launch, we as a small country have two satellites in space. Qatar's got two satellites in space. I mean, I represent Qatar Media City, and I'm trying to bring all these stakeholders together. And we come across all the cloud organizations, all the AI organizations, everyone comes to us because we have big purses, so, so I mean... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I was going to say... We've, we've got two clouds at the moment. We've got a Microsoft <laughs> and a Google one covering the whole of our space. Yeah. So, and we're paying a lot of money for it, and we're not using them at all. So I'm just saying, um, basically, that's what's happening. Huh. So how can, you know, I'm saying, you know, for example, Microsoft and IBM, they built a, you know, they built an infrastructure which is worldwide, and it still continues and maybe uh, the antitrust elements have been happening over and over again. So what's your question? My question is, can we have, um, you know, the cyber cyberspace defined in some way okay. that it gets recognized by so, global uh, entities like United Nations uh, and then... If I, if I can summarize that, I think, I think that was one of the big, one of the topics, two topics in fact, we, we had up there on the stage and I'll, I'll just get probably, you know, kind of jog my mind and do a quick summary of that and then I'll, I'll let the others chime in. But I, I was going to say, you've been, uh, you, I mean, you have had um, attacks over the past so many weeks, months, years. Um, so I was going to say, no, you are not alone. And then you said you had big purses. So I was like, yeah, yeah there, are, there are people who are attacking who have big purses. So, so I you're not say, alone. It's, it's the standard risk reward thing. I mean, you're the guys to attack, right? That's where the money is. It's the consultants yeah. preventing those attacks. So. Uh, well, the, you know, the basic, the, uh, I think what we agree, uh, at least in this room, I didn't get any challenge there, is that we don't really have clear norms there, right? It is, it is I mean, Shavan was, Shavan Chad, Rod and uh, and Shark probably had the same consensus that they're, they're, they're still vague and there there is clarity required, right? But it has to go from there. I think the ask is is there, but uh, this is too fragmented, right? I mean, we are doing something. There is global commission on cybersecurity stability doing something. I'm sure Web is doing something. Everybody's trying, but I think that that is something that we need to come together for our own mutual assured. Dis uh, disruption, disruption, right? <laughs> and dependency, <laughs> and dependency, right? Yeah. So, so I think what, we were really scared when the nukes are out there, so mutual assured destruction was there, so we'll get the dis disruption and dependency, take care of that. I'm sure, I mean, I, this has started, this trend is not stopping, I think, until we reach that station. That's a big milestone for it. Okay, sorry, I took, uh, I was going to say, back, back to the risk reward, I think one thing we should remember is that if cybercrime has led to one good thing, is that we don't see bank robberies, physical bank robberies have disappeared. That's not true. Oh, that's not true. Yeah, to, not to a large extent, but I think, you know, if, because if you look at the, the risk-reward ratio, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're doing a cybercrime, the, the, the risk of getting caught is minimal, and, and the people know that they do that in the right domicile, they won't be even the one living after them. So, of course, you know, someone can sit in some remote country and attack you with zero risk. So, therefore, it's much more interesting to do that. I will give an example. Um, so, I lived in Singapore for four years. So, you know, one day I was talking with the head of EDB based in San Francisco, we were making a joke. Singapore government, ha Singapore is a country that has nothing but air. So, every single thing they need to buy. The only thing which is free in Singapore state or nation is air. You need to buy water, you need to buy resources, you need to do everything. 
So when you're resource constrained, you try to be creative in any way. So a lot of things you mentioned that you know, you know, your 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 state trying to build is because of the the, the, the constraints. Uh, now, so just to say that, I mean, if then I will quote what Rod actually mentioned uh, that I loved during the panel. It's a wonderful spinning of also my favorite military philosopher, um, Klaus Witz. So, so, so war is a um, uh, reflection of politics, but the nice meaning is the politics is a reflection of socioeconomics. So Singapore has a very strategic position itself because it's a small nation, has no resources, they buy resources easy. But how you leverage between Asia slash China, right? Uh, on the coast of Southeast Asia and the US. And I come back to your question, how actually the nation needs to make decisions based on what challenges you are having, who are your allies, and how you enter into the frameworks, economic, social, or political, military, to position yourself in a way that you can be least attacked, or we can all avoid It's attacks. a combination of tactics rather than just looking at, okay, I'm going to stop cyber attacks, and that's going to, you know, sell me, right? So I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to add to that by saying it's, if you think at a corporation level, you would, you would look at enterprise risk management, and you would say, security risks are part of that evaluation. You would have all your geopolitical risks, you would have your regulatory risk, operational, etc. And a, on a, a, a global scale or, or by, um, by country even, it's looking at security in, in, in its singular element, but also in the round with all of those other risks as well. And a point that uh, Andrew made earlier that I particularly liked was that when you have the right people uh, making the decisions and contributing at a senior level, you can truly evaluate those risks. So you can quantify the security risks in a way that actually, at corporation level, you would ensure that you're uh, aligning to your strategic and commercial priorities. And that actually, at national level, you're looking at the entire security of the nation. So that was. Just one final thought. Great. All right. So one question. I'll take your question and then please think of one question that has not been asked, like slightly different from the topics that we should. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Please go to Dave. Okay. Dave, Dave, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Just a quick one. As an acquirer and investor in innovative technologies and solutions, if it's not a big brand or a trusted, a trusted enterprise that we're purchasing from, how can we be assured or confident that nefarious code or hardware isn't built into the applications? I think that's a, that's a, I mean, it's a great question, as I said before. That's not a million dollar question, not a million dollar question. I think it's a unicorn you know, question. Yeah, but you know, supply chain risk and third party yeah. risk, I mean, not only hardware, just the fact that you're hooking your systems up to your suppliers and your customers and so on. I mean, everything like that is opening up. I think that's the far bigger risk and one which you cannot really control yourself. So, bad news. Yeah. yeah. No, actually, there is a. So, this is where I can probably legit put. Uh, World Economic Forum, which many of you know, um, has uh, you know they have their own initiatives. So there is a, a board advisory. Uh, I, I think there is responsible investment in cybersecurity. There is a paper that Trolls and his team wrote. I think you should look at that. That's a very well written um, uh, report. Ten, not big, ten pages. Um, we can circulate or maybe look it up. It's a, it's a very good, very good resource. Okay. Two minutes. Okay. Yeah, just um, probably just to follow up on that earlier question, and it, the cloud discussion got me thinking about this again. A lot of money has been spent by industry and corporations. This is great frameworks, and I think the comment was we've spent five years catching up. But I think to the earlier question or statement before about lots of stuff still not getting done right, and the bit I touched on earlier is. I think the advances in technology, it's speeding up. It's like, well, how well placed is the cybersecurity profession to actually be more forward looking than today when I think a lot of the industry is still grappling with, you know, almost old economy problems, which, which they're not actually doing a great job with. So I think it's probably a question and a statement for the future of cybersecurity is what needs to change to not fall further behind when I think the industry's done a great job catching up in the last five years. What needs to change? I think the same question that in a, in a little bit different yeah. form. 
Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think it's in, it's in humanity that we keep mis making mistakes. You can, you can yeah. repeat the history, you look back, you always learn something, you keep uh, making mistakes. So you simply cannot avoid it, but, but one thing is just coming... Maybe take it. <laughs> yeah, here you go. But, but, but first of all, just coming to terms that, you know, a lot of debate about um, trying to avoid mistakes, um, it could be actually saved in terms of the time, because we will for sure make mistakes. The only one thing that I have, um, you know, thinking a lot about is um, the previous company uh, of the same people who built this current company, we built a company which was sold to Salesforce. So when we when we try to do the integration with the existing platform, which is hard, right? If you try to integrate different platforms and you have the problem of security, it's just hard problems. And those are the problems you can foresee. I mean, when you work in the space, it's just very hard to foresee it. Now, the only thing we can do, if, if you look 10, 20 years forward, what are, I would say, what are the trends, what are new technologies, right? Um, differential AI, um, you know, quantum computing, edge computing, um, every single thing which actually will be in the next wave of the connected uh, communities. And you just foresee those trends. And if you're an investor, if you're a founder, if you are actually building your companies and technology in those space, and then think about this problem about cybersecurity, that's the only thing we can do. Um, beyond that, you know, personally, I don't see other, other reasons. So to summarize, foresee what are the major technology trends in the coming five to 10 years. And if you are stakeholders in that, and if you really care about it, think about it now. Otherwise, just come to terms that you won't make mistakes. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts? Maybe quick 30 seconds uh, on, on, on the change that we need. Like one, one change that you'd like to see. I would say it comes down to uh, the advice and the interpretation of security risks for me at a board level and ensuring there is the right level of understanding around innovation, disruption, strategic changes around technology, and, and just ensuring that the, the right level of strategic agenda is given. Yeah. I think I can repeat what I said last year when we were here, you know, the fact that I think we on the good side working more together and sharing information keeps being very started. important. I don't think we are there. But no, exactly, but we're on we the, have to. There's a path at least. Which we we're have to. I, I think that that is the trust that we need in this community, I think the expansion of the community. This is a, I mean, we live in this digital world, but I think we tend to forget that you're humans after all, right? So, so I think that trusted connection, you know, that I've learned from Robert, that I've learned from other friends here, that connection is what we need. So with that, uh, thank you. This was awesome. This was a little bit change, right? I mean, uh, to get you all engaged. Um, so with that, thank you, Karen. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you.